Snotites, a weird and wonderful microbial form of life, thus named because of their similarity to human nasal mucus. But that's pretty much where the similarity ends, because they're about as alien a life form as we can possibly imagine, making their home generally inside the dark and wet depths of caves, where humans fear to tread, and with good reason if tonight's story is anything to go by. Another fantastic one from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all back to you. Well, my dear friends, it's another Wednesday, and time for you to all sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. I decided to write this for a few reasons. One, to honour my fallen comrades. Well, to be perfectly honest, I didn't actually see them die. Either way, their bodies now belong to the cave people, albeit dead or alive. And two, because the world needs to know they exist. Of course, it says that we discovered, but I suppose it's only I who's found them, since it was just me who survived the onslaught. That is to say that no one else escaped. Well, that I know of. It had always been a childhood dream of mine to go further in than any man alive. Ever since I learned about it as a child, I had wanted to explore the entire cave. To put things into perspective, experts have estimated the cave to be over a thousand miles long. So far, only 400 miles or so has been mapped out. Its nickname is the Limestone Labyrinth, an apt description if you ask me. There's also 200 other caves that have disconnected or broken off from the main, well, well the self-made structure. To say that Mammoth Cave is intimidating may just be the understatement of the century. My name is Joe, and I'm known as the Endless Thrill Seeker in my town. A local hero? <laughs> you can hardly say that. Growing up in the backwoods of Kentucky, I've naturally become an experienced woodsman who spent many years in the great outdoors. Hunting, fishing, camping, rappelling, mountain climbing, free falling and cave diving. I've gone spelunking while fearlessly exploring uncharted territories and well, everything in between. Even four years in the military. So, needless to say, I'm an adrenaline junkie. I suppose I should begin by explaining a few things. I need to be completely transparent and upfront with everyone. No, this isn't a monster, a demon, or even a ghost story. Something to note that it isn't predators, which you can visually see most of the time, but what you can't that scares me the most. Not only the darkness in these massive underground endless tunnels and caves, but also fear of the unknown. It's one thing to see a wolf or a bear, I can deal with that. Run for the truck and haul ass, but, well, how the hell do you escape something you've never even heard of? Who knows what the hell is even in there? Well, those are my thoughts as I weighed the risks before entering illegally. Oh, wait, I forgot to tell you. Wildlife experts say there are over 130 different species of animals within the cave. And those are just the ones we know of. The cave boasts some of the richest caverniculous creatures, including 14 species of troglobites, animals that need to live in a cave. Oh, and troglophiles, animals that can live in or outside a cave, known only to exist there. One of the park's most well-known and unusual species is the eyeless cavefish, which is adapted to the lightless environment by no longer growing eyes. The cave system of Mammoth Cave National Park began to form more than 280 million years ago. The earth rose and twisted and allowed water to erode the rock into the current cave system. Mammoth Cave was created by the natural process of limestone erosion, known as karst topography. During this process, rain and rivers slowly dissolve and shape soft limestone, creating a vast system of caves. Underground rivers are still carving new passages today. Beyond their scientific and recreational value, 
Karst aquifers like Mammoth Cave provide drinking water for approximately 40% of the US population. The surrounding forest contains one of the most diverse habitats in the nation, supporting more than 1,300 flowering species and bird species like bald eagles, wood warblers and thrushes. You can see flowers along the hiking trails. In the 1800s, railroads were the best way to access the cave. The first railroad to the area opened in 1859, and by 1886, the line ran directly to the cave, bringing in tens of thousands of visitors every year. Two of the original locomotives, number four and number two, are on display today in the Mammoth Cave terminus at the end of the line. You can use the historic Mammoth Cave railroad bike and hike trail to access the locomotives via the old railroad corridor. Well... Now that you know a little history about myself and the cave, I'll get right to it. This is simply my tale of the deepest, darkest depths of the largest cave system in the world. And what a who I've encountered. Admittedly, making the biggest mistake of my life. Venturing into the unexplored areas. <laughs> There's a reason we aren't meant to dwell in caves. This is the stuff nightmares are made of. Our group consisted of myself and three military buddies, John, Mark and Tom. John and Mark I have known since we were kids, best friends for years, did everything together. Just a few crazy guys from the backwoods of Kentucky. Nothing too special about us, so to speak. However, Tom, he's the real badass at the group. Older fellow in his forties, a tough of nails kind of guy, very quiet. One of those really tough looking cigarette smoking, gun toting lunatics that you just wouldn't want to mess with. He'd never told us the kind of things he'd experienced overseas, and we never asked. Tom would be our guide, being the most experienced in Mammoth Cave of the group. The four of us spent weeks preparing for this expedition. Saved up money, took off from work, gathered all the supplies and gear necessary, packed clothes, no packing lightly. Many portions of the cave are so small you have to crawl around or simply suck in your fat gut to fit through the narrow paths. The walls close in so tight you can barely breathe in some places. For the most part, almost all caves tend to stay at a reasonable 52 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 11 degrees Celsius for all you foreigners. So we wear long sleeve shirts and cargo pants, naturally. Everyone checked to make sure they had extra flashlights, knives, backup batteries, climbing equipment, ropes, and more. Hell, I even packed some waterproof matches, just in case. Tom, being the overprepared guy he is, never leaves home without his beloved 45 caliber M1911. Used by the US military for decades. A very tough and durable weapon, to be sure. After feeling as though we were all all ready to make the trip, the truck was loaded up with all our gear and four adventurous, crazy bastards looking for the next thrill. Fortunately, it's a four-door truck with a six-foot bed and plenty of space. Son, do you even know where the hell you're going? Tom says with a cigarette in his mouth. Ashes falling onto his bare skin. He doesn't even flinch. Nope, not exactly, Tom. I just... Th just then, the driver's side door flings open as I am forcefully tossed from my seat. Hey, it's my truck, you asshole. I yell with confidence, thrusting my chest forward and chin up high. Yep, when I'm driving. Got a problem? Then move me. Tom says as he flicks a cigarette in my face. John and Mark both look at me with a kind of, hey, what do you want us to do, expression, but only stand and watch. With a deep sigh, I exhale. I accept defeat as I whimper and open the door to the back seat, murmuring to myself while doing so. Sitting behind Tom, looking at the rope in my lap, and just thinking, hey, what if I just wrap this around? Damn. Sorry, off to a bad start here. Really need to get out of my own head sometimes. Right, 
So, back to our adventure. Tom starts my truck. The engine roars loudly and the exhaust is fired up. Yep, it's one of those 80s trucks with no catalytic converter. A three inch straight pipe all the way from the headers at the engine to the muffler. Which doesn't really muffle all that much. It's just loud, okay? Take my word for it. Well, Tom hits the gas pedal, revving the engine, then shifting into drive. Forward the truck moves, shaking violently as the terrain is rough in the mountains. Mark speaks up. Yo, Tom, ease it up a bit, would you? Tom doesn't say a word. Adjusting the rearview mirror, glaring directly at Mark sitting next to me. If I didn't know any better, I'd say he was looking into his soul. The rest of us appear puzzled, looking at one another, thinking, Tom seems a bit off today, though we say nothing. Damn it, I lost my dog in the woods today, took him for a hike, spent all morning looking for the bastard. Thor never came home, Tom said while staring at the rocky roads ahead. The silence in the truck remains, only hearing the truck's engine continuing to rumble as the gravel road is shooting small rocks from the tires and the sounds of nature from the wilderness around us. Moments pass. Mark taps Tom on the shoulder. Hey, sorry man. Maybe you'll come home by the time we get back, Mark says with assurance. Everyone else speaks in unison. Yeah, saying cheerfully. Tom doesn't say a word and looks out the window at a deer scurrying off into the woods. The trip to get there is a few more hours of banter, laughing and joking. Eating beef jerky and smashing a few cold ones along the way. <laughs> Maybe not the brightest idea, but if you have time to think, you have time to drink. Am I right? We're almost there. Hope you boys brought your Cub Scout badges. You're about to see some serious shit. Tom says as he throws his final cigarette from the truck. Each of us looking at one another, smiling like, oh yeah, sure, mockingly. Departing the truck and grabbing our gear, we park far in the woods. You see, you can take tours of small lengths of the cave itself to get a glimpse of what it's like. However, we are venturing into a more unknown entrance. It's still midday and the sun is out. Tom leads the way. We begin hiking to our final destination. All along the unmarked trail, I tie little red banners with reflectors on small trees to hopefully be able to use these to find our way back to the truck for the journey home. Tom looks down, holding a paper hand-drawn map. He stops and points. That way, saying as he commands us. I veer in John's direction with an unsure expression on my face, signalling, is he sure? Along the hike, we're met by several creatures of the forest, including squirrels, birds, deer, and even a black bear. Undeterred, we push forward and reach a large opening in the ground. It's so dark, you can't see anything but the walls for a few feet, <laughs> using only the sunlight that's slowly darkening. Ah... This is it, boys. Tie a rope around that tree. We go in here, Tom says while pointing down into the depths of hell. Each man gears up and slowly repels down the rope, hanging over a hundred feet deep. Four LED headlamps are on, brightly looking in every direction. Almost like how you see spotlights in the sky. On the way down, the massive and seemingly dark hole I can feel it getting colder. The walls are wet and slick. Our footwear are weatherproof, tactical magnum boots with slip resistance and extra ankle support for climbing. Finally, my feet touch solid ground as I unhook myself from the rope. Reaching for the three-cell police-style mag light attached to my belt, I shine it upwards. I can see the top of the hole with this particular flashlight the distance range for the maglite is roughly 450 yards. It's about 411 meters. John beckons for me to follow, as Tom has already begun his trek forward into the cave. This path is open widely for as far forward as we can see. 
Looking upwards, you'll see stalactite formations hanging from the ceiling. Some rooms are as large as an auditorium. Our headlamps are currently what give us illumination. Placing my three-cell maglite back into its holster, we move forward. Walking carelessly for roughly two to three miles, we reach a portion of the cave which changes drastically. Tom, John and Mark rested briefly before dropping to their bellies to crawl hundreds of yards through a narrow passage, their packs and helmets scraping under a rock ceiling barely two feet high. The colored walls range from beige to dark brown. After many hours in the 51 degree subterranean darkness, our clothes are dirt caked and we're still working toward a remote section where the known map stops. The next part of the path we're on leads to an area where patience is paramount. Tom leads the way gripping a rocky ledge deep underground. He lowered himself gently down a 12 foot drop off, his headlamp flashing past rock walls dotted with sparkling gypsum in a remote section, off limits to tourists and recreational cavers. There were eight inch ledges we had to walk slowly across, using only our gloves to grip onto certain dips in the cave walls, eventually reaching a somewhat normal path again where we could walk upright. We were led deeper and deeper into the dark depths, or oh, so I thought. Mark says he sees light coming from up ahead. Our group moves towards it cautiously. There's another entrance Tom has led us to that was partly developed for tours before it was abandoned during World War II. Steep steps descended through rock and into a trail filled with cave crickets, which eventually gave way to areas of rockfall, caverns and drop-offs. Crunching in the silence, our trek took us past broken oil lamps, abandoned shoes and rusted sardine tins from the 1930s and 40s. Footprints made decades ago were still frozen in the dust, as if on the moon. In one spot, ancient shark teeth were embedded in the wall. You could even say we found a place that's frozen in time. By late evening, our group had hiked climbed and crawled through rock piles, small passages, soaring domes and drop-offs in a section called New Discovery, dubbed that in the 1930s. We passed pools with translucent crayfish and walls plastered with gypsum blooms that looked like flowers. Several times we spotted passages that hadn't been explored, making notes for future trips. During breaks, we sat in the dust and rocks, eating candy bars and canned sausages and trading stories about cave trips and war stories from our time in the military. At this point, we are quite deep within the cave. John pulls me aside to tell me that an hour ago, he swore he saw a creature standing over eight feet tall with four arms, stray long hairs hanging from the back of its head. He was terrified and... Well, I believed him. I've no idea how we didn't notice the change in him. Well, of course, he is always so quiet. It can be hard to notice, I suppose. So I urged Tom over to have John tell him everything he's seen. There's a very loud, low-pitched growl, which we hear very audibly. The roars grow louder with each passing moment. Tom instructs us to shut off our headlamps. A slight miscalculation on our part. A few of us thought the darkness would aid us in this situation. Our mistake was thinking the dark was our friend. What we didn't realize is that we merely adopted the darkness. These creatures, or cave people, were born in it. I can feel the ground of the cave vibrate violently as we're quickly surrounded by yelling and screaming from an unknown language. Tom lets out a deathly scream. I can hear him fighting for his life. John turns on his headlamp. I grab my three-cell maglite, shining it in the direction of the struggle. There, before us, stands a massive being with four arms, with a strange-shaped head, almost cone-shaped. 
and they see Tom damn near being squeezed to death. He reaches for his gun and fires twice into the torso of the being strangling him. It drops Tom and retreats. Now, all of our lights are on and we make a run for it, moving as quickly as possible. Myself, John and Mark run as if we're being hunted. At this point, I think it's fair to say that we are. Winded and sore, Mark stops to regain his composure and takes a breath. Where's Tom at? Wasn't he right behind us? Mark asks, unsure of what had happened. Looking around, we see no sign of him, as the three of us discuss the risk-reward factor of going back for him. Well, they're sure as hell hostile, and the only gun in this cave is half a mile back that way, John says. Yeah, but he was our only guide, and a dear friend. I say we go back for him. Plus, we have no idea where we are, or which way is out, I say, unconvincingly. After a few more moments of arguing and pleading our cases, we're soon interrupted by that same terrifying loud growl. Shit. Come on, let's go, Mark yells. Though we're moving at rapid speeds, I can hear more footsteps closing in all around us. Mark is in front of me, and John behind in the last position. I see Mark hit a wall, only... Only it wasn't a cave wall. Rather, another cave person creature. He fell to the ground. The creature leans down and grabs him, lifting him only using two of its arms. The other two arms strike down on Mark's face. I see his head fall forward into the creature's chest. It looks down at me and smiles. John and I turn and flee immediately in the opposite direction. We tremble in fear at the sight of these beast-like people. The ground of the cave is uneven and the terrain is quite rough. John falls face first, hitting his chest on the solid floor. I stop to help him up as he struggles to free his foot from a hole. The same cries are heard in the area we ran from before. John is still stuck, and his boot is lodged tightly. He yells for me to run and leave him. After moments of attempting to cut his boot off, I see the same creature from before approaching. I blind it with my maglite as it screeches loudly, swiping at nothing. It falls to the ground and hurls a large rock at me soon finding John on the ground. He also attempts to blind the towering creature kneeling above him. He grabs John lying on the ground nearby and starts to gnaw on him, biting his leg clean off. This damn thing is so strong. I knew immediately I stood no chance in a fight against it. Once more, John yells in agony and demands I run like hell, tossing me the hand-drawn map which Tom had held earlier. I take off running again at full speed, in horror, as I hear my best friend being torn limb from limb, helplessly. His screams will be with me forever. I ran for what felt like hours. I went up and down the cavern. Eventually, I slept in a very low ceilinged room that I was certain they could not reach me in. Their bodies were far too large. The cave grew quiet. I heard only crickets and my heavy breathing as I slowly crept into a restless sleep. My head lay on my pack. After some time, I felt water dripping onto my face. I woke up to a dim light on my flashlight tapping on it, trying to bring back illumination. It dies completely. Apparently I'd left my mag light on by mistake. There's also a cave salamander on my chest, which is multicolored. While running, I'd lost most of my supplies. I still have rope, matches, food and water. My headlamp still works for now. 
My extra batteries must have fallen out during my retreat. I'm still wearing a compass on my wristwatch, which evidently is not as waterproof as it's advertised. Oh, wait. Never mind. The watch is actually now broken and cracked, but the compass appears to still be functional. All I have for now as a guide is this crudely drawn map and compass while deep, deep underground. I'm now afraid of every single noise I hear. Paranoia kicks in at an all-time high. Continuing to backtrack as best as possible, I notice bats are moving rapidly in one specific area. I do my best to follow them, as some areas are very narrow and low to the ground. I can still hear bats screeching in the distance, however, I can no longer see them. Hoping like hell they're heading towards an exit, any exit. Chasing the faint sounds of wings flapping, I fall on top of these old, steep steps. To my amazement, I've made it back to an entrance that was shown earlier by Tom. At this point, I've been running for days, fallen down many times, and completely lost, bruised and bloody. My clothes are soaked and wet, but, well, I'm alive. With all the strength I have left, I pull myself up and cautiously make my way up the unkempt stairs. The sound of roaring in the distance quickens my pace significantly. No matter what that is, I do not want to come face to face with those things again. It's safe to say, my days of cave exploration are well and truly over. I'm out of the deep, dark abyss. Now in the forest, once again lost, but on familiar territory, land. I can see a stream of water nearby. Thinking to myself that well, I'm all out of water, I grab my canteen, I lean over and take a drink of the clear blue spring water that I hope is clean and not contaminated by giardia cysts and cryptosporidium oocysts, which can cause diarrhea or much worse. Then I begin dunking my canteen under the water, filling it up, sitting for a break and taking a breather. I observe the area around me and begin to notice the stream is flowing rapidly. I quickly remembered from my time in the wilderness to follow water leading downstream. Eventually, it will lead to a river or even civilization. After gulping down as much water as my body can hold, I begin following the waterway. Traveling for hours, I reach a clearing in what looks to be some type of structure. I try to yell out for help, but my vocal cords are damaged. I can barely even speak. In this moment, I'm grateful for that fact. Because I have now reached an entire colony of these cave people. Dozens of them are moving about, some gathering wood. They're speaking to each other with their hand movements mostly, and some grunting. I saw one completely rip a small tree from its roots in the ground and walk away with it under one arm. My mouth drops, and I gasped quietly upon seeing so many of them. Just then, an idea occurs to me. Maybe they aren't violent people as I'd previously thought, although I am pretty sure they killed my friends. But... We were intruding in their home. I mean, if someone broke into my house, I'd shoot them, no question about it. That being said, I'm not risking certain death by confronting these giants. From a good distance, I continue to watch them for days, studying them. In my pack, I have a paper and pen. I wrote down notes, as much as I could, here are some of the things that I transcribed. Day one, I saw a smaller giant-like cave person join the group. It looked oddly different than the others, and spoke more audibly than the rest. The smaller ones collect berries and hunt smaller animals, vermin and such. Day two, the giants seem to have some intelligence about them, as they're using tools and building structures out in the forest. 
I saw Tom drag from the cave opening and the creatures shrieking and yelling when they saw him. I covered my mouth as I saw Tom barely breathing. One of them carried him back inside as the others were flailing their arms violently at Tom. I never saw him again after that. Day 3 The smaller giant cave people sleep outside the caves while the larger ones live deep within. They hunt only at night and, well, work during the day, so to speak. Their skin is light brown toned. That's the best I can describe it. Day four. Well, it seems as though they can't hear very well, which is why they don't talk or grunt a whole lot. So that explains the body language and rapid hand movements. I just saw a smaller cave person point in my direction. Day five. I left the area. I couldn't risk being caught again. My location had been compromised, and I have nothing left to eat. Retreating is the only option left at this point. I can only imagine what would happen if I were captured as well. Day 6 I take a very long way around the colony of giants. Along the way I caught and ate a wild animal. <laughs> Not my proudest moment. But screw you, I may die if I don't get some nutrition in me soon. I don't know what day it is anymore. If the cave goes on for a thousand miles, there's no way of telling how long these woods go on for. My compass has failed now. I've tried following the northern star, checking the trees for moss. I thought the cave system was bad. Now I know. <laughs> it's an ironic habit of human beings to run faster when we've lost our way. Here I am deep in the forest with barely anything. This may seem counterproductive, but I move only at night, as the days are too hot. Many nights come and go, and I think I can see a mountain in the distance. If I can reach the top, maybe I can see a landmark to head towards, with some luck. Maybe even a home. I rest every chance I get, as my body is weak taking every opportunity to fill up my canteen once more, still afraid of every noise I hear. Leaves rustling and branches breaking at any time at night. My own over-exaggerated movements sometimes startle me. I begin to slowly venture towards the mountain in the distance, traveling for a few more days now. I collapse to the ground and pass out from pure exhaustion. No idea how long I'm out for, but I'm awakened again and completely disoriented while being entirely doused in water. Frantically sitting up, I see two men with rifles standing around. One is looking down at me. Hey, this son of a bitch ain't dead, one man says. The other man turns to face me. Well, I'll be damned. The larger man bellows out, with an accent even I can barely understand. Where am I? I ask weakly. The first man laughs and says, You're a long way from home, son. Here, let's get you up. The two men carry me to an all-terrain vehicle and lay me down next to a dead deer in the back of the four-wheeler, which I assume they recently just caught and planned to eat. God, hope I'm not next. The trails are bumpy, but somehow I fall asleep on top of the deer. When I come to, I see a barn, a farmhouse and two double-wide trailers, with tons of farm animals frolicking about in the pasture. Eventually, the men guide me to a shack where a young woman nurses me back to health and takes me to the local sheriff's department, where I get in touch with family, where I get in touch with family, and a deputy takes me to the local bus station. I relax and look back on the last few weeks as I make my way back home. Whew. I'm forever grateful to that random redneck family who saved my life. I wish I had a chance to thank you, but quite frankly, I still don't know where I was or who you are. Well, if 
you ever travel to Kentucky and want to tour our caves, please be careful. There's still so much more that we may never know about them. So I'm really, really delighted to do another story by Bearded Veteran there. First for quite a while. Uh, You know him from uh, the Vigilante series mainly. And um, we're going to be continuing that at some point in the future. When I get my ass into gear, namely. (laughs) But that's just a little bit of a taster to get you back in the mood for his work. Really creepy story, wasn't it? Had some bad experience in caves when I was young. Um, Maybe I'll tell you about them one day. Um, Quite sad story, actually. The loss of um, one of my teachers due to an accident. Well, don't want to dampen the mood too much, but thanks for joining me. And of course, I will be back again very, very soon. And I hope you're all going to join me again on Friday. You are, aren't you? Yes, you are. Well, until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now... Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?